Mr. Holder, Cowboy, Grandpa, and another individual that we just were never able to identify. Um, if you watch the video, you'll see he's there for a little while, he gets some kind of an autograph, and then he leaves. Ms. Uh, Nicholson gets her photograph and looks at the smile on her face. That she's had, she has no idea what situation Mr. Holder is about to put her into. She has no idea that she's going to become a wanted person in a murder of one of LA's most beloved people. She takes this photograph, she hightails it back to her car, and immediately goes on social media and posts her photograph. <clears throat> Ms. Nicholson said, testified, that while she was standing there, she heard Mr. Holder talking. And she heard him use the word snitch as if he were calling Nipsey Hussle a snitch. That's what she said she heard. She didn't know the context. She didn't know what was said before or after. It didn't seem to bother her think that she wasn't troubled by it, whatever the tone was, it wasn't troubling to her. But she said that's what she remembered here. She did not hear Nipsey say anything other than it seemed like he was just trying to stay chill and just kind of just brush whatever Mr. Holder was saying off. That's her description of what she heard. We know Mr. Douglas said, well, no, I never heard the word snitch. And Nipsey definitely didn't say the word snitch, and I never heard the word snitch. This was a conversation between two homes, where one is trying to tell the other one, who hasn't been around, so may not know, that there's some stuff going around about you that you might want to take care of. It was more in the nature of advice. And it was cool. Think about Cowboy. I hope he doesn't mind me calling him that. It's easier to say than Herman Douglas. He grew up in this neighborhood, right? This neighborhood is a neighborhood of some bad people in the neighborhood doing some bad things. There's no doubt about that. But it's also a neighborhood of some good people and some tough people at least they wear a certain facade of toughness. And probably because of the environment that they are growing up in and living in, they find that useful. But every single person from the neighborhood who came in here and testified, including Cowboy, showed that vulnerability that lies just to me. They all got emotional in this case when talking about Nipsey Hussle. As much as they didn't want to show it, and you could tell they didn't want to show it, from Carrie Lathan, who was clearly trying to avoid questions, to Cowboy, to Ingrid, to Nate Wright, they all sort of had a moment of breakdown when talking about Nipsey Hussle and what happened to him that day. Now, Cowboy, He's an old G's from the neighborhood. You can't tell him anything. Talk about a gang expert. What gang expert is going to be better on the roll in the 60s than Herman Douglas? And I think you could tell from the character of his testimony that he's a straight shooter. He goes on Instagram and tells people, I don't care what you think about me and what I'm doing because I know I'm doing the right thing. You grow up in a neighborhood like this, the one we're talking about here, where the 60s claim, I hate to use that because it doesn't belong to them. Still, it is an area where there are pockets of concentrated poverty in this neighborhood. And there is a gang that exists there. And it thrives there. The young men who grow up there learn 
I think more than the average person to be aware of suspicious behavior or anything that can be threatened. There's an expression that you live with your head on a swivel because you're constantly looking for an enemy. Anybody who wants to get a 60 will go to this area because that's where they'll likely find one. So you look for danger. He didn't see anything or hear anything that day that made him think for one moment that there was any hostility or that Mr. Holder felt any hostility toward Nipsey Hussle. So whatever that conversation, and we don't have a recording of it, whatever it was, we don't see the hostility in the video. The witnesses who were there and within earshot didn't hear or see any hostility, the likes of which you would expect if there was some provocative act that would give rise to a heat of passion defense just wasn't there. Herman Douglas loved Nipsey Hussle. He still loves him. I think that came across very clearly, if nothing else, in the way he dresses, but the way he talks about him is so authentic. If he thought for one moment Nipsey would have been in danger, he never would have left the parking lot to go eat his salad or whatever he had for lunch. He never would have allowed Nipsey to stay in the parking lot. He knows Nipsey doesn't have security. He knows he's not armed. He knows he's out there bare in front of the world. He wouldn't have allowed it. That's some of your best evidence that whatever this conversation was about, it wasn't provocative in nature. Ms. Nicholson goes back to her car. And Mr. Holder leads that conversation. He goes back to the master burger. He then walks out to her car because he needs additional money to pay for a drink or something. He goes back into the master burger. He then walks out and walks over to the group again, shakes a couple of hands, and he leaves. They leave um, about 3.18. So they think they're there for about six minutes total. I think that's right. And they leave out in her car, and she takes off. And she says she's ready to go, but he's given the directions. This is not her city. It's his city. And he tells her, turn here, turn there, basically go around the block. And she said he was acting normally. He didn't say anything about Nipsey. He wasn't complaining. He didn't say anything like, who does he think he is? He doesn't own this city. He doesn't own this neighborhood. Nothing like that. He said he seemed normal. But as she turned that block back on the slots and she saw him manipulating, what she saw for the first time that day, the black semi-automatic handgun. It looked like he was putting bullets in the magazine. And she alarmed that he was gonna shoot either at her or out the car. She says, you're not about to shoot from my car. And he just kind of shrugs it off and puts the gun away. He was, he was already planning to kill Nipsey Hussle, ladies and gentlemen. That's planning. That's premeditation and deliberation. That's thinking about it before you do it. Already puts the gun away. Tells her, okay, turn here. Oh, go over here. I'm going to eat my fries. So she drives behind that fat burger and into the alley. He starts eating his fries. He puts on his shirt for the first time that day. Why? Because he knows he's going back. He's already planning that. There's no reason for him to walk around all day with no shirt on, get in the car, and then all of a sudden put the shirt on in the car. 
He's putting that shirt on. You give him whatever element of surprise he can get. The, the, the thing is, when you walk around with no shirt on, you look extra. Right? People tend to notice you a little bit faster. As, as Ingrid said, when she saw him standing there with no shirt on, that's what kind of caught her eye. Because she's like, okay. <laughs> you put the shirt on, and then the, the approach he took back to the group was to stay out of their view until he was right up on them. He walked back down the alley with his prize, placed them on the hood of a truck as he made his way around back to the, the strip mall. And he laid eyes on the group that was still congregated between those two cars. It was Nipsey, Carrie, Shermine, Red Paul. So he turns the corner. He didn't, he didn't go into the parking lot so they could see him approach from the middle of the parking lot. He walks along the back side of it with two guns. One that he likely had the whole time in his front pocket, based on the bulge and the imprint that you can see when he's in the Massenburg. But now we know he has two. Whether he had the other one the whole time or whether it was somewhere in the car, we don't know. But we know he has two at this point. And he's walking up on this group, having a Sunday conversation. They have no idea what's about to happen. This is that video clip in real time. Problem is the holder here. Now, a couple of things to note, <clears throat> and forgive me if I repeat myself, I have a tendency to get ahead of myself, but when he walked up to the group, he said, your group, your group, he didn't say, I'm not a snitch, he didn't say, why are you talking? about me. He didn't say, why are you hating on me? He said, you're through. Now, <clears throat> I don't think I'm overstating this or overthinking it, but when you say you're through to somebody, that seems like a broader kind of rejection of the person. Here you have <clears throat> Nipsey Hussle, who's a successful artist, from the same neighborhood as Mr. Holder, who's an unsuccessful rap artist. Obviously beloved, everybody's taking pictures with him. The girl who brought him to the parking lot is excited to see him. I submit to you that the motive <clears throat> in the motive for killing Nipsey Hustle had little or nothing to do with the conversation they had. There's already a pre-existing jealousy or envy in Eric Holder toward Nixon Hustle. Objection. Arguing and gentlemen, you heard all the evidence. <clears throat> it is your determination to decide the facts. Uh, counsel are arguing their recollection, but you are to decide facts from the evidence presented in this court only. 
Now, I will remind you, <clears throat> motive is not an element of the offense, and the people don't have to prove it. Sometimes motive is obvious in a crime. Sometimes it's not. There are some indications here of motive, though. And you're free to agree or disagree with what I say about this. But in never telling Miss Nicholson that he knows Nipsey Hussle, especially when she points out that she's excited to meet him, and making no comment once he got back into the car, uh, and saying you're through right before shooting him, and shooting him the number of times that he did, and then kicking him in the head after he's already shot him 10 or 11 times, that's personal. That wasn't based on some conversation about some good rumor. Council can disagree, but that's the evidence that we heard in the case. When you watch this again, I'm going to play it a crop in a little bit more in super slow mo. Notice that when Older approaches the proof. They're, they they see him and they're still just and once he pulls out the gun you see Nipsey reach he sees it first everybody else is still sitting there and then he starts firing Nipsey drops first and he drops like dead weight it is likely that the first or second shot is the one that severed his spine. Because once he goes down, he's on his side and he's on his back. And he is living through being shot over and over again because you can see as he's on the ground, he can't move his legs, but he can still move his arm and he's holding like his arm up as he's being shot over and over. After he goes down, Carrie Lathan turns to run. He catches a bullet in his back that drops him to the ground. And he can't. He can't even crawl. In between shooting Nipsey and Lathan, Shermot gets shot. Because when you watch the video, you can see, we know he's shot in the front. After Nipsey goes down, Shermai starts to turn and run, exposing his back. That shot had to come before he turned and run. Holder went over there, I submit to you, to shoot everybody that was in that space. And I tell you why. <clears throat> because he doesn't know who else might be packing. He knew when he left the parking lot and started loading his gun and he wasn't out there by himself. He knew that there were people around him. He doesn't know who's armed and who's not armed. So when he goes back, he goes back with not one, but two guns. Because he doesn't know what kind of resistance he's gonna face. But he knows he's gonna take out everybody right there to make sure that he doesn't get shot and that he has an opportunity to shoot the others. And that's exactly what he did. The only reason Rempa didn't get shot is because he got out of there. I mean, he's like a track star running out of that space. Even in slow motion, it's going to look like Rempa is running at regular speed. That's how fast he was. Let's take a look at it. See Nipsey here. Arms up. Defensive posture, but unable to move. Oh, 
folder. Now when you watch this, you'll see when Holder fires his first few shots, he starts to run from between the cars. He backs out of there because he doesn't know if there's going to be bullets coming his way. I mean, this is Roman 60's sort of meeting place. The fact that no one out there had a gun that day is a little surprising, but he caught them all slipping. He caught them all slipping. And once he realizes nobody's shooting back, what does he do? He runs back and shoots some more, and then he retreats. Nobody's shooting. He runs back, and he shoots some more. He shoots 13 shots, maybe, maybe 14. We don't know exactly. because We don't know how many he started with, but we know eight came from the semi-automatic, and the rest came from the revolver. <clears throat> then he flees past the master burger poor Chris, Christian Johnson is scared for his life down on the floor and we can at least see the revolver in his hand as he runs by Let me say a word about Christian Johnson and some of the other witnesses. I think it was Mr. Douglas who said, video tells the whole story. The, the video tells, if, if all you had is the video in this case, you would know Eric Holder ambushed this group of men and shot and killed Nixon Hustle in cold blood. The video tells you that. You don't need a witness to tell you But I did call some witnesses because it's my prerogative. But I also thought as jurors, you're gonna see some people and might wonder who they are or, or what they saw or heard. So for example, Mr. Mr. Johnson, um, he was in the Master Burger with Holder he was there during some conversation between Holder and some young women. Did I need to call him as a witness? No. He didn't really advance the ball much, but he was there. And he was willing to come to court and he was willing to tell you what little he saw and heard and how it impacted him. Same thing with Danae Wright. Do you remember Danae Wright? She was the woman who jumps out of her car and starts running. Then she runs back to the car and she runs again. When I saw the video, I noticed that. And I wonder why is she running back and forth to the car? You don't realize from just watching the video that she has a child or children inside that car. And what a terrible thing it must be to be a parent in that situation. Right, because we all would like to think that if we were in that situation, we would never leave our kids, right? But you, you just never know how life will put you in situations where you, you, don't, you can't rehearse for this. Do I run? Do I say, oh, my kids? Do I go back? Do I stay? I... I just don't, I, I can't even imagine what that was like for her. So this, this crime, these bullets just didn't kill Nipsey Hussle and injure Shermai and Lathan. These bullets traumatized the whole community. And crimes like this, the enormity of these crimes is that they can't be contained. E even as, as bad as it is, murder is, attempted murder, 
is assault with a firearm, as bad as those crimes are, there are a lot of unnamed victims in this. And the bullets land either in a person or they hit a wall, they, they stop. But in a figurative sense, these bullets are still traveling. This neighborhood has not forgotten. And that's part of the enormity of the crime. Mr. Holder turned the corner, and we get a look at both guns, one in each hand, as he runs by, I think that's camera 21. Let me see if I can uh, play that. And he's already on his way back to Ms. Nicholson's car where he had her leave it because he knew what he was about to do and where he wanted that car to be when he got back. He wanted it to be ready to go. Facing 58th place, ready to get out of there. He knew when he got out of that car with his french fries what he was going to do. That is premeditation and deliberation. Thought about it ahead of time, and then he did it. That's all premeditation and deliberation means. It doesn't mean that you plan something for weeks. Okay? It means you think about it, and you do it. We all engage in premeditated and deliberate acts every day. Some of the most ordinary decisions we make involve thinking about what we're doing, the consequences, and then doing it. Crime is no different. He started thinking about this well ahead of actually pulling the curtain. He could have stopped at any time. When she said, what are you doing with that gun? He could have changed his mind. He didn't. When she parked behind the fat burger, he could have said, you know what, let's go. He did. As he's walking down the alley, calmly, with his french fries, he could have changed his mind and went back, but he didn't. When he turned the corner and he saw that Nipsey Hussle was sitting there with other people, people he didn't necessarily, he didn't know, but he knew he was about to shoot, he could have changed his mind but he didn't. That's what it means to premeditate and deliberate on that. After each shot, he could have stopped. But he took the next one and the next one. That's premeditation and deliberation. He jumps in the car at 58th place. We've got a little bit of video of that. Now, Ms. Nicholson said she heard the shot. She was, she was about to leave. But she didn't know what was going on. And we see her kind of inching out, inching out. And she stops. He eventually gets to the car and he tells her to drive and she takes off. Now let's talk a little bit about Ms. Nichols. You know from the evidence we took a long, hard look at Ms. Nichols. Not that she knew that Nipsey Hussle was going to get shot, but we looked at her behavior after the shooting. She heard gunshots, she saw him with a gun, he comes back with two guns. Later, she hears Nipsey Hussle got shot, she knows they were there. The question arises, when she allowed him to stay at the mother's house, when she got, you let him use her ID to get a room the next day, was she doing that 
to assist him in evading the police. Right? It's a natural question that you would want to take a long, hard look at. Because that question existed, and she was being called to testify, both at the grand jury and here, it raises a question of what her rights are under the law. She doesn't know her rights, unless you tell her. So before she was interviewed by Mr. Washington, he told her, these are your Miranda rights. You weigh these rights and agree to talk to us. She said yes. Five hours. No, no. you know, I need a break now. I want a lawyer now. No, she, she cooperated. Five hours. And then later, she was asked to meet with the district attorney. Again, she was advised of her rights. She weighed them. We talked. Another two hours. We got to the grand jury. You know from the evidence that I initiated the immunity agreement with her. Because, because she was going to testify under oath, it is the better practice to make sure that the witness has a lawyer and understands that she has a right to request immunity. She didn't know she had the right to request that, and she never did until she was told. So we granted her what's called use immunity. Use immunity means we're giving you immunity for what you're going to say in this limited place. Not transactional immunity, which is immunity against ever prosecuting you. It's a broader immunity. We're just going to immunize the statements that you make in court. We already had seven hours of interviews with her, statements from her. If we were going to prosecute her, we already had the evidence to do. But the decision was made, and she was never charged with any crime, because you may not see it the same way. But I'm taking time to say this. She's not on trial here, obviously. But I'm taking the time to say this, because I think it's important. In listening to her testify, and how she processes information, and how she makes decisions, she whether it was willful neglect or willful blindness, she is, was honest when she said, I really wasn't convinced he did it until I saw it on the news. I suspect many people, the moment he came running back to that car, would have been highly suspicious. And certainly by the time they got home and saw on social media that Nipsey Hussle was shot, Many people would have put two and two together at that moment. I don't think she did. And I think that comes across in the evidence. That she really wasn't convinced until she saw a news report. That's either here nor there. But I'm, I took the time to say that because I wanted to explain what the immunity was all about, if you had any questions about that. Um, what was impressive about her is she immediately gave up her phone. And not just here, you can look at my phone. You can extract all the data from my phone. You think about how much personal information we all have on our phones. It's probably making some of you uncomfortable to even think that somebody could go in your phone and extract all the data. <laughs> all the phone calls, text messages, photos. It was impressive that without knowing that was coming, she said yes. Search my car, search my apartment, search my mom's house. And we did. And um, after doing our due diligence, uh, she got the agreement that we gave her and, and we heard her testimony, which is the most important thing. They hightail it back to Long Beach. Meanwhile, pandemonium is breaking out on the floor. Hey, turn your on,
I mean, two versions of this video. I did not intend <laughs> to include that one in the, in the closing, but uh, that's the video that you heard earlier at the trial. And, or you saw earlier in the trial, you didn't hear it because I didn't like the sound effects that was included there and it uh, included it. But um, the point is that as they're rushing back to Long Beach, Nipsey Hussle is dying, if not already dead, in the parking lot uh, that he owned. And Carrie Lathan and poor Carrie, nobody's paying much attention to him as he's on the ground, unable to move, in pain. And and Shermai, of course, has the um, bloody <laughs> torso from, I mean, just think about how lucky he is. Uh, he believes he pointed out the bullet that hit him. I don't know, you know, if that is possible, but he got hit, and the way bullets fly, it didn't penetrate him, but he had a hole in his shirt, a hole in his belt, and he's very, very fortunate he didn't have a hole in his gut, because that very well could have killed him or caused him a lifelong, uh, lifelong agony, pain, and, and whatnot. Eric Holder did all of this to a neighborhood that he didn't live in for quite some time. We don't know exactly when he left the neighborhood, but he wasn't living here anymore, which also kind of raises the question of why would he care what rumors are going around all around about him in the neighborhood where he doesn't even live? Right? He hardly comes around. Nobody has seen him in a long time. So how could how could a rumor inspire so much rage in a person to justify a, a manslaughter? You know, it's like he said to Nipsey when Nipsey was telling him that this was going around. What did he say? He said, "Oh man, they just haters. They just haters." He just brushed it off because it's not a big deal. We know it's not a big deal because the defense, the defense's own gang expert testified that it's not a big deal. These things happen all the time in the hood. There's always rumors going around. It's a rumor mill. And when they do happen, there's a way to deal with it. And how did he say it's dealt with? The same way that Herman Douglas said it's dealt with. You, you get confronted that there's something going on. Okay, let me take care of it. Let me show you that I, I didn't do that. All the time. Ordinary. Not extraordinary. The charges. The judge gave you a lot of laws. We're going to talk about the law, especially the law of the passion. But let's, let's get the charges clear. Count one is murder. We're going to get into the definition of murder a little bit. But basically, uh, murder is of two degrees. And the best way to think about murder is, think of it this way. All murder, by default, is second degree murder. Unless something makes it first degree. What makes this murder first degree is premeditation and deliberation. A murder with premeditation and deliberation makes murder first degree murder. There are other things that will make a murder first degree, but they don't apply here. Shooting from a moving vehicle would make a murder a first degree murder. And there are other things, but here we're relying on premeditation and deliberation. Counts two and three go to victim Carrie Lathan. We allege in count two that Mr. Holder is guilty of attempted murder of Carrie Lathan. We also allege that he's guilty of assault with a firearm. These charges cover the same conduct. Same conduct charged in two different ways. They both define distinct crimes. You'll be asked to reach a verdict if you can on both counts. 
don't worry about the fact that they overlap or they, they point to the same content. That, that, that's contemplation. That's for the judge to worry about. If he's convicted of both, the judge knows how to handle that. But um, we charge him with attempted murder because, as I told you, the evidence shows that he went over there willing and intending to kill everybody in that space. Nipsey was clearly his target. But he was intending to kill everybody or chase them away if they happened to get away. And they did. Attempted murder is when a person takes a direct step toward killing another person. That, that's what it requires. A direct step. More than mere planning. So let's say Eric Holder got his guns, he got out of Brian Eda's car, and he started walking over to the mall, intending to kill, and then changed his mind and went back to the car. Before he pulled the gun on anybody, before he pointed it, before he pulled the trigger. The question, is that attempted murder? Because he had the intent to kill, but did he take a direct step toward killing? Probably not. Not if he shuts it down in the alley and goes back to the car so far removed from actually carrying out the act. But once you point a gun at somebody and you pull the trigger, you've taken more than a direct step toward carrying out the act. The law doesn't require that the gun be fired. Attempted murder does not require that a, a victim be injured at all. The focus is on the conduct of the perpetrator. Did he have the intent to kill, and did he take a direct step toward killing? We submit to you he did in the cases of Shermai and Lathan. And there's no better evidence of that than he struck both of them. He actually shot both of them. Assault with a firearm. You point a gun at somebody, it's, it's, the assault is completed as soon as you point the gun at them. You know, whether you would tend to fire it or not, it's of no moment. So, um, the attempted murder, I know you will grapple with that. You go through the facts, look at the video, understand the context of the situation, and I'm confident that you're going to agree that when he went over there, he was intending to kill anybody that was there. And the only reason he did it is because Lathan went down, became a non-threat. Shermai ran away after getting hit, turned the corner, became a non-threat. And, and Rimpaw took off across the parking lot, never to be seen again. I mean, literally, well, he was seen again because we, we heard he was interviewed. Uh, but he, he didn't come to court to testify. You know, that's probably the one witness that I, if I could have produced him, would have produced him because he was also there during the conversation. Uh, but, you know, we tried. So counts two and three, counts four and five, same counts, it's, but instead of Lathan, they're aimed at uh, Sherman. Or the, Termites the victim in these two counts, but it's the same concept for them. And count six is fell with firearm. Mr. Holder had previously been convicted of a felon. As a convicted felon, he could not possess a firearm. And we know on this day he possessed not one but two firearms. So I know the judge read a lot of instructions to you, and it sounded very complicated. But by the time I'm done, I hope that you're going to say, okay, this is manageable. We got, we understand what the prosecution's theory is here in this case. One count of murder, two counts of attempted murder for each victim, two counts of assault for the same two victims, and one count of felony fire. Some of the law I've already talked about, so I can go through this quickly. But it looks like it's lunchtime. So what do you want to do? 
will you be finished in five minutes? No. Ladies and gentlemen, let's check out the Okay. Let's play the zoom.